Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about hard drives. Um, I could go deep into you know grains of magnetic uh, material and stuff, but I'll try and keep it a little higher level, a little more fine for programming, and maybe uh, what we can all do to make things work out better. So, uh, so this is a, a talk here about the uh, kind of the changing world. So in the, in the old days, um, we had a RAID. And so we'd put these redundant drives and we'd strike them and we'd tune them like a nice Ferrari. Um, you know, parity stripes and, and data stripes. And uh, it worked really well, but it's really kind of brittle. It's kind of, uh, you know, it's really high strung. And, and the new stuff that we're looking for is uh, a scale out kind of concept. And they're not all the same, they're not all tied together. You know, if one of these guys has a little problem, this whole raid goes down um, and, and rebuilds itself and stuff. Uh, whereas if you go out with a big massive parallel system, variable sizes, unstructured data, uh, you should be able to be much more tolerant of, of things going wrong and uh, get the speed up because it's even more parallel. Ends up being a, hopefully a nice future for us. So we're looking at that going, wow, that was kind of cool that the world is changing that way. What can we do to play in that game? So in the old world, um, Everything had to be matched. It was all performance matched, size matched, everything matched. And so we would go off and we'd have a factory yield of capacity, you know, how good we could get those magnetic grains working and the heads working and all that. And then we'd have to go, well, you know, this drive did yield six and a half terabyte, but we got to ship it as a six because that's what everybody wants. And that's the way it's been for forever. So we said, you know what? If we could like break this up into 100 gig increments, we could pretty much give you a 6.5 or a 6.3 or a 6.2, whatever it yielded. And then when we first release a product, you know, we're yielding in the middle here. Half these drives end up as 5s, the other half ends up as 6. As we go, you know, six months down the road, a year down the road, that yield's gotten better. You know, we've learned to do things even better. And so the yield that you would get as the consumer would be higher for, you know, relatively the same price that we were doing before. It's the same drive, but you get more capacity. If you're looking at scale at big, big stuff, then uh, you know it's a good it's a good play for everybody. And the fact that the data center is tolerant of variable sizes, it works out great. We all get to use it. Uh, here's another concept of you know you're building your big data center and you're counting your pennies, and, and power ends up being a really big one of those. So uh, traditional big three and a half inch drives are running in the 7200 RPM range. And um, this is pretty much what, what they take. This chart is showing as uh, seeks here, and if you've got a, just a really high performance seek all the time, or if you have what we call just-in-time seeking, which says, you know what, I've got a rotational latency, I'm waiting for the disk to come around. I don't have to put the pedal all the way down, I'll just put it far way down. So there's a lot of folks out here doing this, which we, we like to do that. Uh, this next line here is uh, helium fill. So if you actually, ship the drive with helium in it, those molecules are easier to get through, they're smaller, lighter, so it does use less power. But what we've done for the, uh, the AD line, the archive line, we actually dropped the RPM down, and so we're running in the mid-50, 400 RPM range. And you can see the power is just really dramatically lower at the lower speeds. So that's another place where if you don't need the extreme speed all the way up to the leading edge, this will give you a much better cost of ownership. So, something else fun to be aware of. That we can, that one of the things we can offer. So this one's kind of out there. Um, no one's really working on this um, yet. Everyone talks about it, and something just I thought I'd bring it up to, to people's attention. So now I've got that big, wide cluster. It's erasure coded or it's replicated, um, and. Most of the time, you know, we, we build a drive, we want the yield, we want the, we call error margin way out here in the two range. And in that case, almost all the time in one rev, you're getting your data 10 to the minus 12. And with some retries, you'll be down in the 10 to the minus 15 or minus 16 range, um, meaning you're going to get your data back. Um, the thing is on that one rev, and you're using it, you might end up with every week or so, or even every day, you'll maybe get one time where it takes two revs or three revs or maybe 10 revs. A lot of times it's servo, it's vibe that cause you to miss and hello. Um, and if it was written a little bit off track because of the vibe, 
you know, you could be there for 10 reps, getting it back, or worst case, there's a defect or something, you can be there for seconds, literally seconds, waiting for that old school raid to come up with, oh, you know what, that command isn't any good, let's go do a rebuild. Um, with the newer erasure codes and replication, it could be a lot faster just to, hey, let's go to the next disk and take it in one rep from that disk. So um, what we like to see happen is a way to make the whole cluster run faster if you can quickly say, hey, you know what, I'm having a little trouble. I've done two reps, I've done three reps, and I want to give up. And let's go get it from somebody else who will get it to you in a rep. Rather than me sitting there for 15, 20, 30 reps going, oh, I finally got it. Here it is. Now, if all the drives ended up saying I don't have it after one rep, then you know you go back to the guy originally and say, hey, well, why don't you take 15 reps and get the data for me? So it's like I say, it's a concept. We're really not working on it yet, but um, would like to push it because it'd be really neat for getting speeds up and getting tolerance. Um, the other thing, people, you know, people uh, in a bigger data center have a lot of kids on skateboards going around changing out drives. So if we could. Uh, have the, instead go, you know what, that was just one error and the drive's really fine, everything's all good. Well, let's just leave it there. Forget about that bit, let's move on and we'll rewrite it some other time. So that's that, that whole concept. And that saves everyone time and money and effort. So, anyway, something for you guys to think about. Um, this is another topic that's been kicked around for quite a while. We actually, to some people, sampled some of these what we would call a, a, a shingle magnetic recording drive. Um, I ended up drawing, somebody told me I ended up drawing Vegas poker chips, but I was trying to actually show how shingle works, um, which is you got a fairly fat head, relatively speaking, and you're, you're writing, and you write the bottom layer here, and you wrote the bits, and then you come around the next rev, and you write the next bits, but instead of giving it a full track width, you kind of overlay it. So this one's overlaid over the previous one, and you build it up like, putting the roof on a house, it's shingles. Um, and I kind of tried to draw it wider and an even fuzzy on the inside, because we can optimize the writer to make a really crisp edge on one side and not so much on the other side, if we, if we really want to get crazy with it. So um, anyway, what it ends up being is you've got to write sequentially. That's the bottom line. So we call shingle maybe recording, it's a sequential write. Um, and we have sequential write pointers that you want to follow and go back and read. If you want to go back to that zone and open it up, um, there's standards, there's a whole lot more fun information out there that we're trying to get in place and trying to modify and get it to, to work right. Because um, everyone does like standards. And then within the shingled concept, there's a couple different ways to do it that we've talked about. So some people like to do the, um, we talk about for a client machine, if you're going to do your laptop. Laptops are not, right now we're sitting here staring at my laptop and that drive isn't doing anything. So it has idle time, it can go unbuilt. So on a laptop, you just spew all the data down sequentially, even though it's not meant to be sequential. And then you come back and clean it up later and put it where you want it. And you can rework and garbage collect and do all those kind of fun things. Um, so it's really nice because it goes in a traditional system. No one has to change anything. But you're going to be sitting there one, you know, wanting to do something, and the drive's like, oh, I'm busy. Sorry, I was garbage collecting. So um, for a data center, not so good for a single unit it can work. Um, the other place to focus here is on what we call a, a host managed or a type 2. In this case, the, the computer system has to be aware of those um, right pointers and keep everything in order. Um, the thing that's good about it, it's predictable. And if you're going to write a big blob down sequentially anyway, it works perfect. You spew it on down and read is random. You can go and read that anywhere you want on there. So random reads are all the same on Anyway, a little intro to Shingled if you guys haven't been in that world. The uh, last little fun thing uh, that I've been uh, interested in here, I think it's kind of cool, it's cold storage. So, you know, in the super high-end data center, you, you have two, oh, you have a question? Uh, I just wanted to go back one slide. You uh, threw up a, uh, <coughs> a, a, an acronym. So, ZBC and ZAC. Uh, yeah, zone based commands and um, zone something or other commands. It's, it's in the standard. But zone aware. Zone aware, yeah. yeah. One, you know, T10 and T13, one SAS, one SATA. Right. Thank you. 
Okay, so cold storage. Um, so you have all these tiers in the data center. So you have uh, you do a lot of stuff in DRAM or right in the registers, right in the CPU. That's really fun. Um, but you can't afford that. And then you go down into flash tiers, and then you go into hard drive tiers. And then after that, you'll drop down even lower into a cold storage. And um, what we'd like to do is see how can we optimize the, the cold storage so you really have massive amounts of data, because we predict there's going to be massive amounts of data. And, and all the big data guys go, you know, after about a week, that data really, no one looks at it anymore. But they might. Uh, Someone told me a story about Halloween comes around and all the moms want to go look at the Halloween pictures from last year so they don't buy their friends' costumes for their children for this year. And so there's a big hit on, on Halloween photos. So, uh, you know, it's uh, cold is an interesting thing. But anyway, if we can store data off cold, we can save a lot of money, which is good. Uh, and keep all those neat little memories back there. So the, the concept here, what I wanted to talk about is um, powering down drives or spinning down drives. So you don't have everybody active all the time. You drop the power in the rack dramatically. You'll actually build your rack just to support, say, one drive per tray. So the, the idea here, I kind of was showing a picture of um, this is two racks sitting side by side. We've got stacks of drives in there. And only the blue lines are, are turned on. And those can be erasure-coded groups of drives. So you'll take your file, your object, and skew it across one of those stripes. Um, and all the other drives are powered off. And those power zones that they're in would sequence. Um, and you could have a queuing system, which is kind of the top idea there, that you randomly bounce around that ring of power zones. Or you have just a hard schedule, and you got to wait in that case. Um, there's always somebody up to write to. But the read, you have to wait. Um, it might be a minute or two to go through the random access, or it might take um, you know, an hour or something if you're going around the loop, depending on what your schedule looks like. And for some cold applications, you know, I wanna, I'm CERN, I want to go pull up some data from two years ago. Hey, that might work just great. I'm going to do some analytics. It'll take me a month, so it's fine to wait for the data. Uh, and how would you put your data in the cold space would be uh, your replicas. So right now, maybe you got three hot replicas. Uh, maybe I have four. I don't know. But maybe I can make one of those cold and still provide that service. A week's gone by, a month's gone by. I can probably do that and still maintain the uh, validity of my data, the, the fact that it's going to be there, uh, but it's just colder and takes less power. Um, and the other way you might do it is people will just erase your code, and that's kind of what I was trying to draw there. Is you take that data, shard it up, put a bunch of parity or erasure coding stuff around it, and it's good to go and you can reconstruct, you can go and lose three or four drives and still reconstruct your data. Um, the other thing, my picture there was trying to illustrate how we jump the power zones around, but in reality, in a center you'd scatter those so they're not even grouped within the rack. They want to all be scattered nicely so whole racks can disappear <coughs> and get your data back. Anyway, that's the fun with cold storage. And that was, that's kind of about all I had. I didn't take up a whole lot of time. I go kind of quick. Just kind of to review, you know, what I wanted to give you guys some idea of stuff I've been thinking about, and, and maybe it uh, strikes a chord with somebody, and they're interested in that. Um, you know, just making the ecosystem better and dropping power and making the whole place a little, a little greener. Um, and kind of our, our features that we're working on: bring progressive capacity, lower power, getting the data back to the user quicker, um, the shingled stuff that might come out, and some cold storage. So you talked a little bit about uh, different ways of dealing with errors. And obviously there's a bunch of device driver and file system engineer types in this room. And you know, where my mind immediately went is, like, OK, what would the interface for that look like? How do I tell the drive I'm prepared to read this and get back like a soft error yeah. versus I'm prepared to read this for as long as it takes because only I at the file system level know how many copies of that in a given pool there are, and so, you know, if I can say read, read maybe, <laughs> yeah, exactly. and get back a quick yes or no, or yeah. yes or maybe, and then go and get it somewhere else, great. But then I got to come back at some point and ask you a different way. Exactly. And so there's an interface there that I don't... That isn't defined. Right. I it's mean, not defined. That's, that's my problem, too, is it's not defined. It seems logical enough, doesn't it? Like, right. it, like it ought to be a good idea. So, so I, I guess my, my point slash question was, 
if, if the rubber's ever going to meet the road, we need to hash out those details. Yes, yes. I, I completely agree with you, and that's kind of why I brought this subject up, is there isn't something. The only thing we have today that's even close is for set-top boxes and whatnot. We do have like a lossy a video stream command, and so we'll just send you all the data, and we'll say, oh, by the way, that one's bad, that sector's bad, that's, you know, but here you go. Um, that, that's the only thing that's even close right now. Yes. Um, very interesting, but would you like to comment about these ideas in the context of, let's say, solid state storage? Um, I think most of that would still apply to a solid state. They still would have, they still have ECC protection, they still have types of things, um, or what particular subject? No, I'm just thinking that, for example, the lower power issue, uh, the advantages wouldn't be as, as polarized there, but I, I'm thinking as I'm oh, sure, speaking, sure. so progressive capacity would work lower power. Yeah. Well, because so yeah. when it comes to lower power, actually, um, some of the PCIe-based uh, devices, which talk NVMe, uh, some of them are, the spec allows for up to 25 watts per so device. So it could definitely be applicable. Um, and that's the 25 watts, and one of the form factors is basically a 2.5 inch, uh, what a 2.5 inch HDD looks like. So yeah, that's some fairly serious power density and, um, and power, there's some real power considerations there. And uh, progressive capacity, I think, also would apply because right. in that case, you know, that's the same issue of yields where, you know, if, you know, if, you know, you're actually over time, the, you know, the, the fab process gets better, then you get higher yields than the same number of physical chips. Now you've got more active, uh, usable data. And so uh, um, you would have exactly the same manufacturing process. Same number of dies, same number of chips, same number of everything on PCB. It's just that in each individual chip, you've got slightly, you've got slightly more, and so you can bend the entire assembly as a, as being a higher capacity. Yeah. Some of those form factors on the solid state storage are getting a lot smaller. Yeah. In sort of yeah. For example, the concept of cold storage that would be a very interesting thing to deploy. I mean, a paradigm of like I've had it switch off that rack actually just becomes. It's just switch off that box. Right. Yeah, solid state is interesting. Right now, there's just not the capacity out there, and the, and the cost numbers just still don't line up yet. Uh, it's got a really neat space to, to stay in, and, uh, and, and these would block the green. Um, for ZBC and ZAC, those are just going to be like an additional set of block commands from SCSI side and, it, and a, an additional, uh, you know, optional command set on the, the SATA side? It's right, like so the SATA side, uh, on the host side, it, it would work with a normal drive, but if you plug in a ZAC drive, yeah. it's going to say, I, I'm not a SATA drive, I'm a ZAC drive. Oh, okay, so this is, so this is we're, we're talking about breaking, entirely breaking compatibility. It's no longer going to be a right. command set. Right. Okay. Because it, well, the, the one on top, the one that was um, internally managed, yeah, yeah. would plug in, say, I'm a SATA drive, thank you. But okay. the other one says, no, I'm a ZAC drive. Okay, okay. Um, I have write pointers. Would you like to read them? Um, okay, so this is this is more like a shift, almost like the way the NVMe does it, where it's still done by T13, but it's a completely dissimilar command set. Yeah, I guess I wouldn't say completely. It's so much of it's the same, but there is just the rules of the write pointer. Don't, okay. Please don't write out a sequence. That's the. Okay. That's the and it is, you know, considered a different type of unit. All right. Could you talk a bit uh, about the so-called Ethernet generation drives, like the Seagate Kinetic? I heard that Western Digital has approached the same <laughs> problem domain too. Uh, you didn't include it into this overview. I would think that it's very relevant exactly to the hyperscale deployment. Yeah. Um, I didn't include it. I was going to, and I was told to pull it the last minute. Um, but no, I think it's I actually I'm spending quite a bit of time on that subject. And we're trying to look at, you know, Seagate has their offering. There's Toshiba, there's HGST. And I'm trying to look over the whole scheme of things. Should it be a really, really small CPU, or should it be a more powerful CPU that's capable of doing more things? And how much bandwidth can we get out of it? And so we're doing some, some trials of trying to understand that uh, as to what's 
you know, how, how, any how does this any add personal value? observation that you can like abstract from your Western digital role and <laughs> share with us, just as colleagues? Well, I, yeah, I think, it, I think, <laughs> like I said, I'm actually spending a lot of time on it personally. I think and within WD, right? Um, and I think there's a lot of value there. I think we can drop the power a bunch, and we can get some parallel, parallel, parallelism going. And the, one of the coolest things about it too is, you know, that RAID, one of those drives breaks, that server goes down. You've lost 15, 30 drives worth with one of these units. Something goes down. Oh, that unit! I lost that unit. I just lost 10 terabytes or whatever. But that's it. I didn't lose. A huge thing of, of 15 drives and you have to go rebuild. So that and the parallelism, depending on what CPU and how much resource I give it, I can get some. I can fill the pipes. Thank you. Um, there you go. Um, the whole SMR thing kind of feels like we're going to have to do a lot of work in the operating system to at least maintain existing performance, if not get the most out of what it can. Be careful of it. Are there any sort of, I, I've not been able to find any good documentation for the recommended way to treat an SMR drive. Do you have anything? Is there any documentation available as to what operating system you should be doing? Um, I, I know that we have some much deeper presentations than I do, and there was some stuff just shown at OCP in Paris about how that does work. Um, and I know the guys are actively working in the T10. T13 committees to help us understand how to how to properly use that. Yeah. Uh, so well, um, so it does do they do anything with uh, research on software? Because I know just in my brief thinking about it, ZFS the way the long structure file system would make it actually lend itself to SMR seemingly really well because the whole base is the fact that you can never really overwrite it. Yeah, there's some cool stuff. Actually, the first one we played with like four years ago was LTFS, which is linear tape file system. And it, you know, worked perfectly. We don't do anything. But I don't know that many people want to run LTFS as their mainline data center. So, so what percentage increase of density or of capacity do you get with the shingle? Is it like 20% yeah. more than... A 20 is kind of a, a number that has been pulled out. Um, and it, it depends. Um, so one of the things like Vibe hurts shingle more because we're, we're doing really good track follow work, right? That's the hardest thing. So Vibe could make it not so good if you want to consider the full Vibe spec, maybe maybe not as much as you'd want it to. Um, if you're in a nicer environment, nicer chassis, then you can get more. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that we're, we're looking at and how to improve that. Um, the overwriting of, you know, right now on a track, we have to worry about the adjacent track getting over it, if we just write the same thing over and over and over again here, we never write this guy, is there any uh, follower? Same thing we worry about for shingle, and now it's zone to zone that we worry about. So there's, and there's things we can do in the rule set, we might even change the, the ZAC standard for some of these things to make it even bigger than the 20%. So what sort of range are you, what, what's the high and low numbers that you would <laughs> put it on it? I, you know, I've heard as little as you know five percent, as high as you know thirty percent. It, it's it's really kind of it's not quite real yet. <laughs> you know, we've we've certainly built a lot of samples and played with a lot of things, but when it becomes a real product, we're, you know, we're close. But not there. Yeah. And you can look at um, some of the other offerings. There, twenty percent is a fair number, though. Some of the thoughts. So I've actually been here, I work for a storage company, so I've been hearing about SMR for probably eight or nine years now. And <laughs> SMR was initially billed as, well, we want hammer. Yes. It'll take a long time to get to hammer. So SMR is the short term stepping stone to get us to hammer. Again, that was eight or nine years ago, so short term is a relative term. Uh, and I was wondering if, if you could speak as to how hammer is coming along and what you know, what the timeline now looks like for Hammer. So, um, yeah, Hammer's really cool. Um, it's, uh, for anyone who knows, so heat-assisted magnetic recording, so we're taking a laser, we're actually um, running the laser light through a light pipe, heating up a little piece of gold, which has a tiny, tiny little tip on the end of it. We get the gold all excited with surface plasmons that drop down off the tip. And, and heat up the drive. Problem is the wavelength of light is huge compared to our bit, so we have to use this little transducer to create plasmons and then have a little tiny dot that goes down and heats the bit up. 
Um, it's uh, a really interesting and really challenging and um, can't wait for it to be working well enough to be in a product. Right now it works and we can do demonstrations, but there's, the lifetime's really bad um, you know, relative to what you want. Years ago, it was, you know, the thing lasted for 100 milliseconds. Oh, cool, and then it burned up. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, now we're, now we're down to, you know, minutes and hours, so that's really great, but it's okay. not, you know, so, five-year so, warranty. So. so so we're still talking probably closer to 10 years away than five years away? No, it's... Or... I, I'm, I'm actually hearing more like five years away, okay. is what, what I'm hearing. So it's it's not kind of tainy. Like I said, there's some pretty cool stuff going on there. All right. uh, so it would be nice, and, and shingle still works with hammer. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it, it works really nicely. The other thing that's thrown in the mix, if you've heard, two-dimensional magnetic recording will have multiple reed heads, and so for a shingle drive, you'll actually listen to what the track is next to you and you cancel it out. It's like a Bose noise canceling headphone. <laughs> so, so that's another really cool technology out there. Yeah, yeah, noise canceling headphones for your head. <laughs> Yes. So a similar topic of really long-awaited industry predictions that yeah. seem to not come true. Uh, you know, five, six, seven years ago, everybody was talking about the inevitability of hybrid drives. Yeah. And how everyone yeah. was just all hybrid drive manufacturers would stick some cement, some cement, some, some, uh, some crappy man uh, storage on there, and uh, that it would then you know be in the best position to migrate blocks around and. Just, Spin the, the spindle down when you could be satisfied out of the cash. Right. What happened with all that? You know, the ATA non volatile uh, cash command set, which I don't think anybody has ever used. <laughs> yeah, there's actually, um, we've actually created a lot of those over the years. Um, we actually, it was at Computex this year, we showed a, a double black drive, we called it, um, and it had a 128 worth of. Uh, flash on it, plus it had um, the HDD all linked up through PCIe, so I think it was a PCIe link um, and a hybrid drive. And it, it's all doable, and it just hasn't, I don't know if we've missed it a little bit or, or not. There's people that are buying them, and we are selling them. Uh, there's some OEMs that are buying these for laptops and stuff, but it never became the, the monster solution for everything. Speaking from a software perspective, we'd love to just make it your problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and we had a bunch of guys trying to figure out, okay, is it hinting, is it hybrid, you know, how do we, how do we make sure, oh, we're using just the OS, you know, or the things that are frequently used, all that caching. And, and some of the stuff, we only know 4K sectors, so we're guessing a bit too, which is why the hinting stuff happened. actually drop entire error detection which isn't improving but the capacity does and uh, so we, we don't have to do that in the disk we could also drop the, uh, we could also expose the spare sectors and actually have large drives and just allow ZFS to manage all of this because it already does that anyway so right right and we're scratching our head too because we go off We've got our own background routines going off, reading data, you know, looking for bits that are getting a little weak, and we go, okay, let's rewrite that. Um, and then there's file systems that do the same thing. Going to data centers, people are like, oh, we're scrubbing the data all the time. I'm like, okay, we are too. <laughs> <laughs> well, <coughs> so uh, I, I was actually down at W Irvine a couple years ago, and they gave us a big talk about a bunch of things, including. Um, uh, uh, error recovery and uh, by the time the drive returns an error to you it has already gone through in some cases you know tens or hundreds of stages of, of error recovery you know and and what you get off the platter in the first place isn't bits it's a, it's, it's a waveform and it goes through all these different things and you know there's in some cases some probabilities as to is this actually the pattern that's supposed to be there or not and you know, and it's a lot of it is very, very uh, hardware specific, and I'm not sure that that's something that can easily be hoisted up into the host. Um, 
Well, I mean, but that's the polarized I, case. I, I, I don't think that's yeah. what he's saying. But the, I was, I was trying to. I mean, that's kind of what I was trying to allude to a bit. Is we, we do exactly what you say. We'll sit there. We can sit there for 200 reps, right? Going around and around and around, and, and meanwhile, the file system can go. Oh, you know what? I, I can get that from over here instead of waiting for the drive right. to be itself. I just, I just, I just wasn't clear what you meant by doing error recovery at the host level. There's, there, there's also the advantage that, like, the thing is, is the drive may, may not be able to say 100% that this is exactly the data, so it'll return an error, but it may actually have a wait, wait for that's like 99% confident that it's a bit. And with ZFS, the fact that it can check some, if the drive can actually return that 99% likely yeah. data, and then ZFS can actually validate whether that data was correct or not. And so there is the ability to, you know, speed up error recovery or even get data that was previously not. Especially yes. the, the problems like misdirect read writes, unpub writes, and stuff like that. That drive cannot actually help you. Uh, and ZFS does it checks on input that it also uh, such problems. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this might be the old school. Uh -huh. If our drive <laughs> is turned off and turned on all the time, it dies faster, doesn't it? So uh -huh. turning off half a rack you know, periodically and then spinning it up at some point down the line, doesn't that reduce its lifespan even though it still has that lengthy mean time between failure? Um, no, it's actually not that bad these days. Um, in the old days, we actually spun the head down right in the center of the disk. You know, we, yeah. we park at ID and that definitely, and we'd go with a laser and we textured the zone so we had little spikes to land on, kind of like landing gears or whatever. Um, and, you know, so nowadays we, we put the head up on a ramp, so the head's really in floating in air the whole time, um, so it doesn't wear. We do check that load and load, 1.2 million cycles we do with load and load uh, of the head. So we can put that away, and, and again, that many times. And the spin up right now, we've got tests out towards eight, 900,000 spin ups and down um, cycles, and that's really just because it takes a long time to do it. And we kind of get bored after that much time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so we, we definitely, we can handle that. Um, it, it's really not, the, it's a fluid bearing motor, so there's virtually no contact inside the motor and brushless motor, no brushes. So um, it's, a, it's become a pretty nice mechanical system from that point. M compared to the old school where, yeah. yeah, you'd be wearing and particles are flying around and bad stuff, but yeah. Oh, yes. Um, so I, I admit to not understanding the physics of hard drives at a very, very low level. Uh, but you mentioned early on in your preso about um, possibly filling hard drives with helium so they're not, so it's an easier material to cut through. Why don't you just act, act, um, operate hard drives in the back? Ah, so <laughs> the interesting thing about hard drive, it's a little airplane in there. Think of it as the airplane. Oh. And so it has to fly. It needs material to fly. Yeah, it's going to have something to fly. At least the helium helps it stay up. I, I did sensors, one of the, one of my jobs, and I said we actually have a weather station now in our drives. We have a we have a humidity <laughs> sensor, we have temperature sensor, and we have a pressure sensor. So that's all you need for a weather station. Do you have a wind speed sensor on the head? <laughs> that I don't, but I'm, I'm controlling my own whim, so I kind of have a pretty good idea what it is. But yes, I, I do need a little anti on there. Yeah, a little spin. Yes. Where does the humidity come from? Well, the, all the drives today are are vented. Um, there's a, uh, they call it labyrinth filter, so it's this long path, and then there'll be a chunk of carbon or whatever else that you want to go through. So it keeps all the big particles out, but it lets the drive breathe. So the drive's running at ambient pressure, and as it breathes, as you know, you heat up and cool down, the air is going to expand and contract, and it's going to pull moisture. And it takes a couple days for the drive to be the same as what the room is doing. Uh, but it does have a humidity change in there, and then that, if you Look at airplane dynamics and all that. You get it as part of the lift. How do, you, how do you keep the helium in there? Yeah. That's Eight. magic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually, um, we've, we've, I got drives that are four years old now that we've uh, put helium in and sealed, and we actually have to impregnate the aluminum casting because the helium will go right through an aluminum right. casting, so it's impregnated with stuff. We have a really cool uh, seal that goes around the top. It's pretty easy to. It's just pressure sensitive foil. Um, and we made a nice 
land to put it on. So um, you can keep it in, but it, it was work to design it to stay. Right. Is does WD shipping any helium? Um, the DST. No, I yeah, know HGST HGST is, is, but not not yeah. the WD sub. Okay. So, so do you think the helium is going to be the future, like all the guys are going to be? I, I think so. It's, it it's drops the power, that. and it, today we server write every drive in helium. So we're already filling them with helium, but then we pull it out and we put air back in because uh, it's just a really nice environment to be in. Thank you very much. All right. All right.